My phone vibrated, slowly moving toward the edge of the side table next to my bed. Is someone calling you? My wife, Karen, muttered drowsily. I didn't respond. I heard my phone, but sleep was too comforting to let me out of its grasp. Mmm. Mmm. God damn it. I groaned, picking myself up out of a restful snooze. I looked at the brightly lit LED screen which displayed the time at the top. 3 a.m. The caller ID showed unknown. I pressed the red ignore call button on the screen and haphazardly tossed my phone back onto the table. I cuddled back up into bed and quickly felt myself drifting off again. Then it happened again. Mmm. Mmm. My eyes shot open. Rage boiled deep inside me. Who could possibly be calling at such a ridiculous time? What could possibly be so important? I whipped the phone off my nightstand and angrily pressed accept call. What? I barked into the phone. The voice that came through was eerie, the voice of a little girl that seemed both familiar and foreign at the same time. She drearily sang, Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. I took the phone away from my ear and looked at it in disbelief. There was no way. Absolutely no way. It couldn't possibly be her. She was dead. She'd been dead for years. The line went dead. Who was it? Karen asked. She sat up in bed and rubbed her eyes. Uh, I started. I only thought about telling her for a split second before the thought quickly exited my mind. I knew what would happen if I did. Scam, I replied, putting my phone back on the nightstand and pulling the blanket up to my shoulders. Deep sadness painted over my face. I let it flush and thanked God that it was dark and Karen couldn't see. She would definitely know what was going on if she could see my reaction. I felt tears beginning to well up in my eyes and fall silently down my cheeks. I closed my eyes and drifted off to sleep. I saw her face in my dreams that night, the face of my daughter, who hadn't been alive in four years come June. I saw her staring at me, laughing with joy. Her body slowly began to change. It started to decay. Her happiness faded. Her smile turned to a hateful scowl. Her skin no longer glowed with youth, instead it turned gray and void itself of any life. Her hair changed, turning black and stringy on her head. She looked at me and said that phrase once again. Ashes, ashes, we all fall. She slowly began to turn to ash, blowing away in a vacant breeze, down. That final line seemed to echo through my consciousness, pulling me from slumber into panic. My breathing was shallow and rushed. My head spun and a deep depression took hold. It was a feeling I was familiar with, but hadn't felt in nearly two years. Everything all right, honey? Karen asked, turning over in bed and wrapping her arms around me. It was warm and inviting. It was comforting and I didn't want her to let go. Just a nightmare, I whispered. There was no way I could tell her about it. That would only upset her, and there was no need to have both of us engulfed by a dismal sadness. We cuddled there for a moment, or maybe an hour. I couldn't tell. Time seemed to stand still as she continued holding me, tightening her grip ever so slightly with each passing minute. Finally, she loosened, reeling her arms back gently before slowly sitting up and slipping out of bed. I knew she didn't want to disturb me, but as soon as her grasp released, I knew there was no chance of falling back asleep. I stood up as well. We dressed ourselves in silence. I wasn't doing a very good job at hiding my emotion, but there was nothing I could do. She didn't hear the voice on the phone. Her dreams weren't haunted by the deteriorating face of our daughter. She began to dress herself as I stood by for a moment. I fought with myself, trying to find the energy and motivation to get ready for work. After a few minutes, I'd come to the conclusion that I would call out. I had plenty of sick time, and as long as I didn't call out two days in a row, I didn't need a doctor's note. I... I think I'm going to call in sick, I said to my wife after a few minutes. I plopped back down on the bed and laid back. Okay, baby, she replied. Her tone was somber, and I knew at that moment that she was on to me. Maybe see if there's a meeting you can go to today? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. She walked over to me and I raised myself up onto my elbows. She was wearing her typical gray pantsuit. It was stylish, and I enjoyed seeing her wear it. If it had been any other day, any other moment, I may have made some sort of advance towards her. Not today, though. She lifted me further, bringing me to a full seated position, and wrapped her arms around me. 
Her tight embrace made me forget all of my sadness. Only for a moment, though. It's okay to feel this way, she told me in a trembling voice. It sounded like she was going to break down herself. But she quickly released and took a small step back. She inhaled sharply and let it out slow. I've got a ton of meetings today. Otherwise, I'd stay home with you. No, no, I said, trying to sound reassuring. That's okay. I can get through this. Just having a rough morning is all. She eyed me for a moment, as if she was trying to see if I was lying. To be honest, I wasn't sure myself. After a short stare down, she leaned in and gave me a small peck on the cheek. I love you, she said. We can talk more when I get home if you want. Try to have a good day, baby. She turned and exited our bedroom. I laid back once again, rubbing my face in a vain attempt to wake myself up slightly. I could hear Karen rustling through the kitchen. She was probably grabbing her usual breakfast, a Greek yogurt and cup of coffee. Then I heard the front door creak open and close quickly. I sat there for a moment, alone. Thoughts ran through my head. What if this was all a sign? What if somehow, some way, Grace was still alive and she was trying to contact me? I quickly pushed the thought away. It was the same type of denial my grief counselor had warned me about. It was the first stage of grief, a stage I'd long since worked through. I turned over in my bed, reaching for my phone sitting on my nightstand. After a quick Google search, I discovered a group counseling meeting happening at 2.30 that afternoon in a local church. It wasn't my first choice of venue, but it would have to suffice. I spent the rest of the morning not doing much. I shot my supervisor a quick text letting her know I wouldn't make it, that I wasn't feeling well, to which she gave a curt reply. Just a quick, okay, feel better. I attempted to eat, even though my appetite was non-existent. I managed to get down a piece of toast with a little bit of strawberry jam and a cup of coffee, but nothing else. It took a few hours before I found the motivation to get out of my pajamas, comb my hair, and brush my teeth. After throwing on some shorts and a t-shirt, I moved to the bathroom and checked my appearance. Despite how I felt, I didn't think I looked too disheveled, save for my hair which was strewn across the top of my head crazily. I reached over to grab my toothbrush when I heard it. The sound sent shivers down my spine and nearly sent me into a panic. The sound of laughter. Distant, echoing, childish laughter. As if there was someone playing in the next room over. I stood there for a moment, toothbrush in hand and the faucet running. I clenched my eyes shut tight and tried to convince myself I was imagining it. It was all in my head. The faint feeling of being watched began to creep over me. The terror had begun to take hold. Then I felt something the lightest touch, as if someone had just lightly dragged their hands across my back. I whipped around in a reflexive motion only to find that I was alone. Jesus Christ, I said to myself gasping for air. I turned back to the sink, trying my hardest to tell myself to get a grip. It was my mind, simply playing tricks. I knew I was wrong when I saw her. She stood in the mirror, a terrifying reflection of a little girl who wasn't there. She stared at me in reproach. Her head slowly began to move from side to side in a disappointed gesture. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Her voice echoed through the room. It sent me to my knees. My daughter stood in the mirror, staring at me. Her face ashen, her hair slick and blackened. As the final word exited her mouth, the image in the mirror crumbled into dust and I found myself alone once again. I sat on the floor, crying for hours. I couldn't move. All I heard was that phrase. The old-timer nursery rhyme that I knew my daughter to love when she had been with us. But she had made it seem so sinister. So haunting. Why? I sobbed, unable to contain myself. Why is this happening? The few small lights above the vanity mirror in the bathroom suddenly shattered, sending me into darkness. I was sent into a full-blown frenzy. I screamed, dreadful, petrified yelps. They were soon silenced. I heard footsteps approach me. Slow, calculated footsteps padded along the tile floor, moving closer and closer. Don't worry, Daddy, I heard a voice say. I looked up, struggling to see through the lack of light. There was a shape in front of me. A figure of a small girl, just standing, staring. Grace... I asked, trying not to break down into hysterics again. Don't worry, Daddy, 
she repeated. You'll join me soon. The room fell silent. I sat there on the floor, sobbing for another hour or so before finally finding the strength and courage to get back to my feet and leave the darkness of my bathroom. As I opened the door, the light flooded into my eyes. It was bright. The pale yellow glow of the sun shone through the windows, illuminating my bedroom. I had no possible way of explaining this encounter. This felt like more than just grief. These ghostly confrontations were something beyond the seven stages of a grieving father. These were a sign. I needed to atone for my actions. I needed to make peace with my daughter's death. I needed to bring her untimely demise to justice. Her death was deemed to be an accident by investigators. They said it was nothing more than a little girl who couldn't swim that had found her way into waters too deep. I knew the truth. Karen knew the truth as well. Parenting was hard. It wasn't for us. We had no other option. And now, Grace was making it known that her soul would not rest until her killers were brought to justice. Until her parents met their demise. I can't find it in me to take another life, though. I can only do what I can for myself. By the time you read this, I will have done it. It's the only way to make things right. I've got the gun in hand. I'm just staring at the metal barrel, waiting for the right time. Waiting for these oxycontinins to kick in, to numb the pain and anxiety. Then, I will make right for the things I've done. Maybe by the time Karen finds me, Grace will have already visited her. I think I can hear her calling now. She beckons me in that terrifyingly beautiful sing-songy voice of hers. I'm starting to feel peace with the decision I've made. I think this is it. I'll be with my daughter. I'll be able to apologize and be the father she needed but never had. Ashes. Ashes. We all fall.